Professor Peterson has been studying Leaf Roll virus since the 19, since 1990, really, right? He was invited to consult with South, uh, with New Zealand, sorry, in 2007, and now we have the pleasure of consulting with him to learn how to deal with leaf roll virus management in California. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peterson from South Africa. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks, Stephanie, for that in, uh, for the introduction. I don't really advertise the fact that I've been working on leaf roll since 1990. It's a little bit sad. Um, <laughs> And, and especially so if you look at how slow uh, information actually gets generated. It's a massive, massive privilege to stand here and talk to you and to share with you uh, some of the experiences we've had in South Africa in trying to manage this disease. Um, I think we had to. We had no option. Um, the virus is so prevalent in South Africa. The vine mealybug has been there since the 1930s. It's absolutely ubiquitous. So it was really essential that we needed to look at controlling this disease. So my talk today is very, not so much on a nitty gritty level. I think I really would like to get some of the concepts across and, and the detail we can really discuss around question time. So, without a doubt, grapevine leaf roll is the most important virus disease in South Africa. We are very fortunate we don't have grapevine red blotch. Um, it causes an impairment of the vascular tissue, and I really must thank Mark and both Kent for, for supporting information to my talk. It, it really will help a lot. So, it causes impairs, impairment of the vascular tissue which results in a number of undesirable properties. The, the berries don't cull up that well, the bunch architecture gets affected, uh, they take longer to ripe, they don't reach sugar levels, yields drop, and um, in a really recent, a very nice study uh, about a year ago in South Africa, wines made in a very standard method, uh, in other words, not compensating for, for deficiencies in, 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 in juices and that, um, showed um, that with, with wine tasters, the country's top 30 wine tasters, showed that there's a definite sensory uh, penalty that's paid for having virus-infected plants. So the other thing is the virus spreads quite rapidly in South Africa. Um, we monitored about 80 vineyards in the, in the, early, uh, in the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and we could show that spread was about doubling every single year. And this is just one of those vineyards. You can see over years as it progresses. There is probably not a single vineyard in South Africa at age eight, nine, where a grower isn't controlling leaf roll, where the incident isn't at around 100%. It is really rife. Um, and the result of this is that our vineyards need to be replaced every 20, 25 years, almost directly as a result of leaf roll. This, of course, has e enormous <coughs> economic consequences. The most important virus, and, and I'm glad Ken showed the, the slide that there are more leaf roll viruses, leaf roll associated virus than just type 3, but type 3 is far and away the most important one. And you have a similar situation here in California. This is really the target that we have to reduce. Mark also mentioned to you that there's no chemical that you can use to try and um, spray for the virus the way you would for a fungicide. So in the case of controlling viruses, we have to look at the epidemiology of the disease. Any of you who've done some modules in plant pathology would recognize this figure immediately. It's the, the disease triangle. And it, and it basically tells you that a disease epidemic occurs when all of the components that I've got over here are together and you have a susceptible plant. So let's look at the individual components of this for leaf roll. 
let's turn our attention first to the plant. Firstly, all the Vitis vinifera cultivars that I am, I'm aware of are susceptible to type 3. Um, there are, there are, I have not come across a single cultivar that hasn't been susceptible to it. It also affects those that don't show the symptom that well, as, as my two colleagues may pointed out. Um, there are only some cultivars amongst the white ones where you would actually see the curling of the leaf as well. Something like Chenin Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc don't really show symptoms ever. It's important that we realize as well that the virus affects the rootstocks, and these are of course other species of Vitis vinifera and crosses of them. Um, although having said that, our most recent work has shown that there's some interesting things happening around the rootstocks. They don't show any symptoms, but if you take a plant like this, typically the rootstock would show absolutely no symptoms, even though it's being uh, it's on a scion that shows very, very severe symptoms. If we test those examples, then in spite of that constant um, pressure from the inoculum at the top, some of the rootstocks don't get infected by the virus. About two-thirds of the plants that we tested had this incident. So we really don't quite know what's happening there, and this is a very exciting um, avenue for control that we need to pursue. If we turn our attention to the virus, and ladies and gentlemen, I cannot thank Mark and Kent enough for telling you this is the weak link in this chain. This is the weak link, the virus. The, the mealybug is a complex organism. It's difficult to control. The virus is pretty simple. We, that's where we need to focus our attention primarily. That doesn't mean that you cannot ignore the mealybug. You have to reduce its level, but this is where the focus has to be. As Mark mentioned, we are very lucky, and this is one of the weak links of this virus, is it doesn't spread by mechanical means. So sap on a harvester, sap on pruning shears, that won't transmit the virus. Secondly, and this is the single biggest weak link that this virus has, is the fact that it only, only infects vitis species. It means we don't have to worry in our um, management, we don't have to worry about weeds, we don't have to worry about alternate hosts on the outside of the vineyard. Our, all our effort can, con con can concentrate on vitis. As Mark also showed, it, it, the virus can be vegetatively propagated. So if you take planting material from an infected plant, most of those cuttings will also be virus infected. And similarly, if you do grafting and one of the two graft components is infected, the other component will become infected. Turning our attention to the mealybug, and I anticipated Kent's great talk, so I haven't gone into any kind of detail barring the transmission properties of, of mealybugs. And uh, I'm kind of worried, but in a sense, it actually looks as if our, our biovar or our variant of the vine mealybug might be even more efficient at transmitting uh, leaf roll than the one that you have over here. So, Kent showed that a number of species of mealybugs and actually some scale insects can transmit type 3 and that, as in your case, vine mealybug is the biggest problem in South Africa. My colleague Kirsten Kruger showed that the efficiency that we find with our variant of, of, of vine mealybug is 70% efficient. So what Kirsten did is she took individual crawlers put one onto, uh, had them feed on an infected plant and moved single ones to <coughs> healthy vines. And in 70% of those instances, that new vine became infected. So they're 70% efficient at transmitting the, the, the virus. Another problem that we have that also looks a little bit different to your situation is that um, the, the vine mealybug in, in South Africa, the ones that we used for these experiments, 
can only need to feed for about 15 minutes to actually acquire the virus. And they can actually, by feeding another 15 minutes on a healthy plant, they can transmit the virus. So the numbers are even lower than those shown by Kent. And, it, and, and it's probably because of different bio-vars of, of the, the, the mealybug. This implies, as, as Kent also showed, that this virus is semi-persistent. That's a term that we use in virology. And that implies a number of things. It means that the virus is lost. It's, it's only associated with the mouthparts of the virus, uh, of the insect. So it's lost on molting. It doesn't replicate in the host. And it doesn't get passed on to the offspring of a host, of, of the insect. Now, mealybugs in general, on their own, aren't that motile. They need wind or other methods of dispersal and this can be by the wind over short and long distances, by birds or ants, um, by man through some of our agri agronomic practices on implements and on workers. And so the epidemiology, to boil it down to its simplest level and taking it from the, the, the virus perspective, is quite simple. How does an infected plant actually become infected in your vineyard. And there's only two ways. The one is that it was either the planting material, that's the only one of the two ways in which that vine got infected, or secondly, the virus was introduced on a mealybug. That mealybug could only have fed on an infected grapevine. This, in its simplest form, is the epidemiology of this disease. Now, the weak link is the fact that this mealybug has to go and feed somewhere on an infected vine. If we can remove the infection, we can tolerate mealybugs in a vineyard at, at higher levels than we can while the virus is in the, in the pathosystem. So, knowing all this information in the early 2000s, uh, a little bit earlier than that, we did spatiotemporal analyses of the way that this disease spreads. And this gives us one fantastic clues about how to go ahead and control the, 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 the virus. So um, we want to determine what are the most common means of spread. Um, and the far and away the most common pattern we saw was this number of infected vines in a row and then movement over the rows. So if you follow the, the cartoon here, you'll see that was the infection in the first year and you'll see there are already instances where there are three, four vines right next to each other that are infected, which would have happened before we started monitoring. And then as time goes by, you can see how the spread moves out. Uh, firstly, along a row, and then over a row. This occurred in just about every single vineyard that we monitored. And it gives rise to these runs of infected plants and ultimately foci of infection. This is spread from that one infected vine to its neighbors. And it's known as secondary spread. It's the the, the spread that happens within a vineyard. And this could be through the mealybugs, through their own motility, being moved on by ants, carried on implements from one infected plant to the healthy plants right next to it, or on workers. The second pattern that's very common is edge effects or gradients of the disease over a vineyard. And in this block, um, the maths isn't that important, but this gradient, you could see clearly how the infection started from this lower portion and how it actually moves further on into the block. I also want to point out that this is at, at a perpendicular uh, orientation to the, to the row orientation, uh, which would mean that this kind of spread is not associated with implements or man, 
but things like wind or birds. Um, you can see how it moves further into the block and how secondary spread starts moving those single vines uh, further within the block. And that gives you these typical edge effects. I'm sure you all see it in, in your vineyards. This happened in about 25% of instances where the, the row orientation between the infected block and the healthy block are the same. It happened um, in slightly lower numbers when the orientation was uh, perpendicular to each other. But we also saw it where there was no obvious vineyard surrounding a vine uh, 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 the block that we were monitoring. And this, is, this implies that that there's a long distance component as well. The uh, virus can be brought in on mealy bugs over longer distances. And these, once again, are possible through uh, implements, once again through workers, blown on the wind, uh, blown on plant material. The third most common um, pattern we observed, and, and this would have been hidden in most of the instances, so it's only a few instances where we would, we would, where we would be able to see this pattern in. And this is very early in the life of a vineyard where you have individual infected plants. Very often these come up, these symptoms would come up within the first season or two. Um, and that's generally quite a good indicator that it's through planting material especially when it's only associated with specific rootstock sign combinations. As in this case, you can see the middle cultivar didn't have any virus, whereas the other three um, combinations had the virus. This could be spread through the planting material, and it can be both the scion or, or the rootstock. The last pattern we observed, and we actually at that stage just had one example of this, was a very complicated one. The grower had had very infected vines on the entire area here since the 1980s. He removed them uh, in total and then in 1999 he only planted the orange portion at the top. He left the bottom portion, the blue po the green portion fallow that block almost immediately got leaf roll to the extent that it probably was planting material. However, what he did is he removed that top portion after only one season and then he planted the, the area that's in these red dashed lines. And you can see in this red dashed cultivar now that there's a much higher level of Mealy, uh, of uh, leaf roll infected plants than in the area that was fallow. So this gave us a really good indicator, circumstantial evidence, but good indicator that the leaf roll was coming through from the previous vineyard. And if you look um, at vineyards that are removed and they lie fallow for a year or two, you'll often find um, volunteer hosts coming up, sometimes even with symptoms, which implies that it's some of the, the scion material that's coming up, canes that were just in the ground and that have actually sprouted. So knowing these spreads, and I'm sure you have all of these patterns of spread in California, how do we go about controlling this disease? Well, we have to prevent each and every one of those means of spread happening. So the, the picture around epidemiology becomes a little bit more complicated. We have a plant that can be infected either through planting material or through virulifarous mealybugs. The mealybug must have fed somewhere on a grapevine. That grapevine could be amongst the peer plants in that same block. It can be volunteer hosts. It can be root remnants. It can be uh, from vineyards very close to the virus, uh, to the, the, the vineyard that you're establishing, but it can also be from vineyards quite far away. So let's uh, turn our attention to each of these. 
planting material. Now, we have a certification scheme, as you do, um, and in our certification scheme, every single clone that gets registered within the certification scheme has to pass through virus elimination to ensure that it is free of leaf roll, and then it is propagated, initially in nuclear blocks, then, it, then into foundation blocks, mother blocks, and these are distributed to nurseries. The virus elimination process um, is quite complicated, but it's very, very effective. The plants are put in a, a chamber at, uh, at about 30 degrees for three months, and then the absolute uppermost cells in the meristem are cut, and a plant is regenerated from those cells in tissue culture. This works extremely well for type 3. And um, those plants derived from that are known as our nuclear plants. And we have had no leaf roll infection in our nuclear plants over many, many years. The important thing to remember is that those plants are now only virus free, leaf roll free. They are still susceptible to the virus. They're not resistant to the virus. They can still be reinfected. And the minute you take them out into the field where there's an inoculum source, they will become reinfected. So one of the things that's done to prevent this is our foundation blocks, a small percentage of them, are taken completely outside of the grapevine production area. They planted out in the desert and there's no other vineyards around them. Those plants are as, as close to being safe from leaf roll as, as any plant could be. These are very expensive vines. They're called three-star rated material and growers would pay a premium to, to actually plant material from them. But the large volumes that our industry needs, and you're a bigger industry than us, um, it's not possible to have your blocks isolated in that way. So in South Africa, the next level of, of, of blocks often get planted at commercial farms. Uh, the, the, the grower will use the berries and the, the plant improvement organization will take the canes. So in that situation, there is going to be reinfection because there's a lot of leaf roll in the environment. So in the red cultivars, we have inspectors going through um, and culling out, roguing the infected plants. Um, and then in the white cultivars, they tested yearly and the infected plants are removed. Now, a very important principle is that leaf roll is a little bit like HIV in the sense that it has a latent period. A period in which you're not going to see symptoms and a period in which doesn't matter if you use ELISA or PCR or even a more sensitive technique like LAMP, there is a period where, you, where the plant, even though it's infected, is going to test negative. So you cannot expect nurseries to actually provide you with plants that are going to be absolutely virus free. So it's important that as a grower, you also do something about infected plant material. And in South Africa, what we um, promote is the use of this three-star planting material where possible. And if not possible, to Im immediately establish your new vineyard and immediately treat the plants with a systemic insecticide. <coughs> the idea behind that is that you would basically um, wait for that plant to show symptoms, wait for the virus to replicate to levels to, to show symptoms, but not to infect the plants around it. And then monitor these plants for, the, for uh, a couple of seasons and then remove them. This works extremely effectively against plant material that's coming that's infected. Um, 
This is an example of that. This was quite a horrific example. The, the grower um, in his first season had, had a almost, well, had a 12% infection through planting material. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. The fact that it showed symptoms so quickly showed us that it was pl due to planting material. But what we found very disturbing right in the beginning was those numbers of clusters that you see there. It suggested that in that one season there was already spread. If that was true, we would not be able to control leaf roll. But luckily for us, that's not the case. We could trace this back to infection of the rootstock in that instance and where the bundles of plants tended to have a number of plants from the same infected source and they were being planted right next to each other. By, roguing, by, by treating that block with uh, imidocloprid and roguing the plants, the next year the numbers are dramatically reduced from 548 that first season down to 27 the next season, 9 the season after that, 14 a little bit of a jump again, 17 a bit of a jump, and then suddenly we were down to really single digits. When you have infection through planting material, the infection you see in front of you will more or less be the number that you need to remove in the end. Here we had a 12.2% infection in the beginning and we only needed to remove 13.6% of the plants to get rid of this infection. So just a slight little bit more than what we had seen in the, in the beginning. So roguing to, to control infected planting material is incredibly effective. Okay, that's so much as that. Now, infection from the peer plants. This is far and away the, the method through which the most new infections take place. That secondary spread is the way that the virus really infects other plants. It's the most critical aspect of control that we need to address. If you look at this vineyard, and I want to draw your attention to one of the three arrows, and I'm only going to describe the top arrow. There was a single infected plant there in 2001. In 2002, there were two infected plants. 2003, there were um, 16 infected plants in that foci. The next year, 53. And then after that, they were coalescing and we could no longer be sure that any infection plant was coming from the particular previous one. Had the grower controlled mealybug and had removed that single vine in that first season, he'd have protected this entire foci. That wouldn't have happened. So the principle really is to get into your vineyard as soon as possible and rogue. It, 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 it's the least painful way of doing it. You're going to have to remove the least number of plants by doing it very early and constantly doing it, never skipping a season. So that you can do in vineyards that are relatively uninfected. And we, we have a user threshold of about 20%. Um, Mark mentioned 25%. That number is very variable. If you see a, a vineyard where you've just got individual infected plants, 20%, 25% is fine. If you've got a vineyard where you're seeing lots of clumps, where there's already been a fair amount of secondary spread, you can be sure that what you're seeing is only a portion of the plants that are already infected and that you're going to have to remove a huge amount in the end. So I just want to sh illustrate this. In this vineyard, in the first season, there were 509 infected plants with some aggregation. In the second season, 
211. The year after that, 110. Then 30, 22, 12, and 10. Now, you can see, we, we, we're managing the numbers down very nicely. But ultimately, we needed to remove 481 vines from that block. More than the initial amount that was there. So, literally, the quicker you can go in, and as long as there's not se too much secondary spread, you can reduce this, the numbers. This is still a far better situation than had this block been remembered, uh, had been left. Typically in South Africa, that vineyard with 509 infected plants initially would have become 1,000 the next year, 2,000 the year after, 4,000 the year after. It spreads very rapidly if you don't do anything. It's important to remove the vine totally, in its totality, as much of the roots as you can, and the entire top. We mark the plants in autumn, and we remove them in the winter when the soils are wet. When you have a high incidence, above about 20% in a vineyard, that's it. You, you can no longer control leaf roll in a vineyard like that. But you must control the mealybugs. Those vineyards can still remain as sources of infection to a block next door, which might have a very low percentage of the, of the virus. Okay. Volunteers, how do, we, how do we deal with replanting a whole vineyard? Well... In the preceding old vineyard that you're about to, to take out, you need to, just after harvest, apply a systemic insecticide, imidocliprid. Um, this is very counterintuitive to a grower because it, that's the block you're removing. But what we're trying to achieve with that is that the imidocliprid be taken up with the, into the roots so that when you remove that vine and any of the root remnants stay behind, that they wouldn't support mealybugs. Then we recommend a fallow period to get rid of any of the volunteer plants that come up. Now, there isn't a time limit or a time coupled to this fallow period. We're not saying one season, two seasons. It all depends on how effectively you remove that vine. If you've got light soils and you can actually remove the vine in total with very little roots left behind, you don't need a fallow period. If you have got heavy soils, lots of the roots are breaking off, you need to get those roots out of the, the ground. You need to plow them up over fallow season periods and you need to get them out of the system. You don't have to get rid of all of them. You just have to ensure that you're reducing the risk. And in your new vineyard, you should keep on removing any volunteer plants from that previous block. How do we deal with when the infection comes from far, these typical disease gradients? Well, it's very important to control the mealybug in both adjoining and distant vineyards. We recommend that you work in the healthy vineyards before you move on to the infected ones. And where that's not possible, that <coughs> implements get cleaned down just with a normal dilute um, soapy solution uh, before entering the healthy vineyards. What if your neighbor doesn't control leaf roll? This situation does happen, and we really, really, I, um, both Kent and, and Mark stress this, and I can't stress it enough. If you can do control on an area-wide basis, the period between an, uh, the industry being half clean and half, half infected will be shortened. The pain of dealing with that period will be lessened because most of the complications in controlling this disease is in that period where there's both infected material and healthy blocks. And this is really, if, you're, if your neighbor doesn't do it, release predators and parasitoids. They will help clean up your, your neighbor's um, uh, vineyards as well. Some examples of leaf roll control. The first place they did it, and, and I was extremely lucky that this 
um, estate called Vergelegen, and I challenge you to say that. Um, Vergelegen means situated far. It's an old estate, one of our really top-notch estates. It was established in 1700, and at that stage that was very, very far from Cape Town, with, hence the name situated far. Um, where it's, it's arguably, it has the South Africa's top winemaker, so it was fantastic that these guys were interested in controlling leaf roll. And we were able to exploit some, some situations. They were in a, in a phase where they wanted to expand on the vineyards, so they were removing citrus orchards and re-establishing vineyards in those places. So that was our first phase. Um, and these were planted between 1999 and 2003, and it represented about 900 acres. Our initial infections in those blocks was, there was about 600 infected plants, which represented a 0.6% infection, very low, relatively low at a, at a start of a vineyard. But remember, had we done nothing, those numbers would have doubled in every year after that, and we've calculated if, if nothing had been done, these blocks would have been 100% infected in about 9, 10 years' time. However, we managed to reduce using all the interventions I've mentioned. We've managed to reduce the infections to now 0.049. That's about 5 infected plants in 10,000. For the last eight or nine years, we've been getting roughly 30 infected plants on a yearly basis. We're not completely getting this disease eradicated. And I think the reason for that is this estate is on its own in controlling the, the leaf roll. Their neighbors are still not doing it. Phase two was a little bit more complicated. This was replacing old 100% infected uh, vineyards. Um, here we had to do a fallow period. So initially they treated the plants with imidacloprid, um, removed the old vineyards, had a fallow period in which they removed all the remnants from the previous vineyard, and then we re-established new blocks. I, I've kept the scale of the graph the same as the phase one, just to show you that in the meantime, planting material in our certification scheme had who had also applied this control strategy, had improved significantly. Now we only started with a 0.09% infection level, and we could manage that down to roughly 0.03. That is minute. It is the exception to find an infected vine in these red cultivars. That whole vineyard that you see there is Cabernet Sauvignon, and this is a typical site, maybe just one infected plant per season. Um, had we done nothing, this, it, this spread that I showed you earlier would have happened. Now, we were working in levels of complexity, so phase three was the most difficult. This is where we had to replace white cultivars with new vineyards. This was done in a much more phased approach and probably a more realistic approach to most industries. So the blocks were taken out piecemeal and replaced with new vineyards. And it's still going on. We still haven't gotten all of the old vineyards out. What makes this phase very difficult is that you need laboratory tests to actually identify the infected plants. So what we did is we trained the cellar technician to perform ELISA tests. ELISA is a very robust technique. It can be um, taught to someone quite easily. It, it doesn't have a lot that can go wrong with it. And so they test on a yearly basis every single white cultivar. They have composites of 10 plants, roughly. It's, it's actually two bays, but so between 8 and 10 plants. And then if a composite comes up positive, we test the individual plants. And the pattern is very similar to what we see in the red cultivars. Um, in this case, you can see a clear gradient because there's a block right next to it that's infected. But controlling this works equally well. Roguing it, 
works equally well. And we've actually maintained the level of infection to below 0.3%. Three, in th three infected plants per roughly 1,000. This is in the industry-wide. In our certification scheme, um, most of our foundation blocks are applying these techniques now. This is 335 such examples. This is a very complicated graph, so I just want to go through it quite slowly. This reflects the age of the vineyards, and it's the wrong way around. The oldest ones are at the, at the origin of the graph, and the youngest ones further down. Um, the incidence is on this axis, and I want to point out that we're looking at a half a percent as the maximum on this graph. There are only four vineyards that actually exceed this amount, <clears throat> those four. Then the blocks are ranked by age, and within any age group, they ranked by the percentage of leaf roll that's there. So looking at, say, this nine-year-old vineyards, and there's probably 130 in that cohort, the vast majority of them no longer have leaf roll. These other ones, uh, the highest level is 1.38% in that block. So really dramatic control. Similarly with mother blocks, it's all pretty similar. There's 119 of them in this instance. The infection, the highest infection is 1%. All similar. Now, it's not just in South Africa where this control strategy is being done, and New Zealand has also done this, and even better than we did in South Africa. They decided they wanted to clean up a whole appellation. So up on the Northern Island, in the Napier Hastings area, there's an appellation called the Gimlet Gravels, mainly red cultivars, luckily. Um, 30 growers, the all 30 growers of that appellation decided they want to apply leaf roll control throughout the area. They mapped 100% of the 80, 800 plus hectares. Um, that, I didn't convert that to acres, but it's massive. Um, and they had a vision of doing this over a four, five year period. These are the numbers. So those blocks that were more than 20%, that usually we'd have said, okay, don't control leaf roll in that, they decided they're going to remove those blocks. So over 70 hectares in the, in the first phase, that's 1,800 acres in 2010, were brought down to only 185 acres by 2015. In the vineyards that had less than 20%, the numbers were initially um, over 27,000 um, plants that we infected. By 2014, that was down to 9,000. I, I no longer um, see them on a yearly basis, so I don't have more uh, recent information. But area-wide, this control has been incredibly effective. Once again, remember, had they done nothing, these numbers would have just climbed. So, at least, at the very least, ensure that your every new vineyard you establish, that you use these control strategies. It's going to differ. California, from what I've gathered from, from talks with a with number of you, you have many more cultivars in Lodi area than we generally use in South Africa. So, we're very lucky. Our main cultivars are Cab Sav, uh, Merlot, Shiraz, and then Pinotage. And they're really easy to see the symptom on, so that we can really control a large number by just targeting those cultivars. I think that situation, you would have to adapt to, to the California situation. The important thing is it can be controlled. It's generally best when it's done area-wide, the greatest risk is in this period where there are many infected plants and you're still trying to establish new ones. The greatest need for mealybug control, the lowest levels you need, are in this transition phase. Once the inoculum level has been reduced, once the virus level is there, 
you can actually tolerate much higher levels of mealybugs in your industry. So really, it's, it's a case of focusing to really try and get through this phase as quickly as possible. And then after that, to really make use of a more sustainable way of control through biological control, basically to ensure the sustainability of the, of the entire process. In many ways, we're a victim of our success in South Africa. I'm having an incredibly hard time convincing growers who've been working, who've been controlling mealybugs through insecticide means, who've reduced the numbers down to very, very low numbers, to now go over fully into biological control. This is this year's harvest from Vergelegen. The grower, we've, we've got blocks that are now 19, 20 years old. The, the um, yield hasn't started dropping. The quality hasn't started dropping. The harvest can be done in, in a single go through. All the berries are pretty much ripe at the same time. There's no color problems. Everybody is smiling in this regard. I want to really thank Stephanie and Lodi Wine Grape Commission for inviting me to come talk to you. WineTech, who's been supporting my research since 1990. Um, I really take my hat off to them. And then uh, my own institution, Stellenbosch University. Thank you for your attention.